This is 15 Minutes of Freedom. I'm your host, Ryan Nidell, and today I have an incredibly special, powerful guest, Brandy Powell, the co-founder of Rhythmia, the transformational resort in Costa Rica. Brandy, how are you today? So good. Happy to be here with you. Thank you so very much. So I have to ask, Brandy, right up front, if someone hasn't heard of Rhythmia and they were to just end up there, end up in Rhythmia, like I dropped them off on your front porch, what's the biggest takeaway they're going to get from being at the resort? They're going to wake up to themselves. Uh, uh, what we call it a miracle at Rhythmia, getting your miracle is actually reuniting with your soul. So, you know, through traumas and false beliefs and the programming that we all go through, we separate soul, you know, from that place where at once we were one with ourselves as a child, uh, it gets caught in all of these different stories. And uh, when you leave Rhythmia, you're reconnected with yourself. And it's the greatest gift that anybody could receive. I absolutely love that. And so let's unpack for a second. Not really for a second. It's going to be a big unpacking. Like, what is Rhythmia? Like, I'm, my, my listeners know, you, you know as you're listening, how advantageous plant medicine has been for me, right? I've openly just shared my mushroom experiences and the breakthroughs with that. And that's like, to me, the tip yeah. of the iceberg. Brandy and I are, are like unified souls in our fact of enjoying mushrooms, not necessarily together yet, but maybe that'll yes. happen one day in the future. But Rhythmia has this yeah. other path. We're we total mushroom brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. So what is Rhythmia? How does it work? What's the plant-based medicine that's associated with it, right? Like, give us, give us the pitch, right? What is Rhythmia? Yeah. Yeah. So Rhythmia is a program that we create around uh, plant medicine and we use ayahuasca as the plant medicine at Rhythmia. And uh, we've basically taken different breakthrough modalities um, and teachings, including teachings with Michael Beckwith, uh, who created a guy. So he has a life visioning course. We have, you know, yoga twice daily. We have farm to table organic food, hydrotherapy, colon cleanse, and then all of these different classes and workshops to help you integrate the experience and understand the experience that you have in the evenings. Um, we also do uh, transformational breath work at the end of the program. That's incredible. That's incredible. So ayahuasca, where is your ayahuasca, I guess, source from, right? Like these are just general curiosities for me. Do you guys grow it yourself? Does it come from Peru? How does it, are you able to share that secret? Like what, where does it derive from? Yeah, this dealer comes to us with a big jacket. He opens it up and he just deals it at no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we, uh, Send him up here to we, Ohio. <laughs> no, we actually have different um, shamans that facilitate each night. Um, and so it's really great, especially a lot of the people that come to Rhythmia, um, this is their first time working with the medicine, so they get to experience different traditions. You know, so the first night is Shipibo tradition, and we have um, uh, the second night is the Rhythmia tradition. We actually brew our own medicine, so our shamans, uh, you know, source the medicine and then brew it there. We also have... Um, a women's night where it's all female facilitators and we will use the Santo Daime medicine, um, which is a really beautiful and more visual brew. And then we, on the last night is our um, Colombian night uh, with the shaman that has worked under Taita Juanito um, from the Colombian lineage. And uh, so it's really cool. You get to have all these different experiences. In Well, that's, inc that's incredible. Like how, where did that even come from? Like, that's such a brilliant idea. Like, I didn't know that going into this, right? I'll, I'll fully say this. The, the reason Brandy and I got connected, a, a friend of mine, Rob Dial, knows knows them, knows Brandy and her husband very well and connected me so graciously. And that that's opened up the springboard that I will be heading down to Rhythmia for, is it seven days, I believe? Is that five, seven days? Some, yep. Some amount of time yep. that is not, not going to week. be long enough, but I, I'm going to want more once I'm there, I'm sure. But I have committed that while I'm there every day, I'm going to share with you as you're listening my entire experience and journey, right? Like I'm going to bring all my mobile podcast stuff down and th that whole week will be the Rhythmia experience as it pertains as it pertains to my growth and, and what I'm going through. But I didn't even know there were that many different modalities that existed, right? Like there, what sort of research, where have you went? Like 
there's a lot that goes into this. This isn't like you just woke up one morning and said, you know what? Yeah. Oh, let's just all do some ayahuasca for seven days. This is this is just what it's going to be. No, no. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's constantly evolving, you know, from, from the very beginning, it started out, we were an Iboga center, and that was the main medicine that Gerard and I were working with, you know, on a regular basis, and, uh, and then we, you know, the medley guided all decisions around, you know, how the program works and what modalities to bring in and what shamans to bring in and uh, what traditions to bring in. And then even those traditions were were modified based on the Western people that are coming in, you know. So the uh, Colombian lineage that we work with, uh, the grandfather is 110 years old. So he's the old, oldest living shaman in the world that we know of right now. And uh he is, he's a boss. <laughs> he's still, he's still training our facilitators. He just went on tour, but you know, he actually, um, took his traditions and, and modified it for it to, to create a, for the one person to have the experience of the jungle. So it's, it's been a process of constantly evolving our program and just, um, you know, with the different shamans that we've brought in and and what their uh traditions and 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 beliefs are we've had to just you know merge it all together to create really our own our own program our own tradition our own way of doing things and it works <laughs> well, i was gonna say I, I love hearing that and like this whole process that you've been through right the growth the expansion when did you get the idea from Ryth- for rhythmia and what created that right where where did this the, the seed get planted if you will for the aboga and then the evolution like I, i'm so curious as to what that was like yeah so um it's interesting gerard and i were, were both working on this before we knew each other basically the same vision and um I used to own a marketing and branding company for most of my career, and I was always feeling like, um, you know, it wasn't really what my soul was willing for. I looked at it like, okay, I'm going to make a lot of money, and then I'm going to fund and do what I really want to do. And what I've always really wanted to do is just be in service. And I've always been into, you know, self-development, life transformation, reading all the all the books that I could get my hands on, going to all the classes. I was a super hot mess. And that was my path to finding freedom. You know, I just was trying to grab as much as I could. And, uh, and you know, I had so much growth and breakthrough, but I found that a lot of the programs that I was doing was like, I was approaching it through the mind. And I had patterns and things that I had been working on for many years, and they still just kept showing up like Groundhog's Day. Especially for me, it was around men. And, uh, you know, I kept attracting the same guy with a different face over and over again. And finally, I'm okay. Uh, I need to find, get to the, the, of what's going on here and shift this. And what I found was that the quantum healing modalities, the, the sound healing and, you know, the different modalities that were accessing, you know, the four bodies rather than just approaching the mind was what was helping me to, to have those breakthroughs on a really, really fast. And uh, for me, I didn't even know what plant medicine was when I started coming up with the vision for Rina. Um, I actually, on the side of my business, I was actually um, working with men transitioning from prison and I created a life transformation program with them, worked with them every week for a year, you know, took them to Agape, took them to Self-Realization Fellowship, took them to the beach for the first time, meditation, and I just loved it. And to see these men have these incredible breakthroughs and people that you would think wouldn't be into this, they were actually super mystical people because a lot of like, the most old souls that we're the ones that come in and we pick up the most fucked up lives, you know, so to basically uh, bring us to that depth of seeking God and trying to get to the truth of ourselves. So it was actually the perfect group to work and I realized that that was really my passion and what I wanted to do. So um, I, after my first penny, I I had this evening where I just really tuned in, meditated and got clear on what, what, was calling and what I want to create. And I heard, um, I said, okay, so how could I serve in the greatest way? You know, because I'm a very sensitive person and I feel all the shit that's going over the world, you know, like, and I'll even like 
you know, if I start feeling like I'm getting too comfortable or in a bubble, I'll like go on Netflix and watch some super fucked up documentary that's going to just like have me in tears and crushed and like pissed off. And then it like, just like fuels this fire. And I'm like, oh, we got to do something about this. What can I do? And, um, you know, so I heard Wake Up the Giants that within every single one of these human beings, we have a gift, we have a calling, and the greatest way for us to serve is to wake the giants. So I made this vision board that I called the Sleeping Giants Project. And I put this, I had this whole idea to create a center in Costa Rica. I was making a documentary film at that time about um, you know, the Costa Rica is one of the happiest places on earth. And so I was comparing it to United States. And, and so I had this idea to create like this, um, a center, but a, a program that where people could come in in a week and have these, you know, incredible breakthroughs, and, like walk out a different person. Um, so the idea was to bring in quantum healing modalities, modalities that would, um, go beyond just healing through the mind, but actually, you know, work on the mind, body, spirit, and, uh, and the emotional body. And so um, I put this on the vision board, and it's crazy. It looks exactly like Rhythmia. It has like little casitas. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, I, I continued building out this vision, and it's just amazing to me how it's all manifest. But um, basically, in 2012, uh, I had a falling out with my business partner. And uh, I was totally exhausted from pushing myself to do something that I wasn't really into and, and telling myself the story that I needed to make this money to be able to do what I really wanted to do. So finally, when that happened, I, I you know, it was scary because I'm like a single mom. I lost a ton of money overnight and I had a choice to either like go to court, you know, for years and fight for this or, you know, to just let it go. And then I also had a choice, like another person was coming in wanting me to create it all over again. And I just, I took the, the risky road this time and I stepped into the unknown and I said, okay, all right, spirit, I'm done being in control. I want to work on one of the biggest movements on the planet. And I spoke it out loud and I like got into full on, you know, meditation mode, calling it in, asking to be guided. And when I did that, a force came over my life and started guiding me in this way that I had never listened to before. You know, before I, w I was operating from like survival and fear and, and um, what was safe. And this time I was like <laughs> going with what felt good and what was showing up. And so what was interesting was these um, shamans from Costa Rica contacted me and uh, asked me to help them market ayahuasca. And I didn't know what it was, but I flew out there and I get to this most beautiful ayahuasca treat center ever. It looks like the Garden of Eden, like waterfall and, you know, just this most beautiful. And, and you know, I was kind of tripped out by what they were doing because to me it looked like a drug. And, you know, my mom is a meth addict. So for me, like anything that looks like a drug – I'm, I'm not down, you know, anything. And also like uh, some of the people that were telling me that I need to do this, like, you know, they were like my friends who were like go to Burning Man. And I was like, hell no. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, when I saw though, I, I, they had credibility though, because they were, they were showing me, you know, these miraculous healings that were happening from this medicine. So I partnered with them and uh, I said, okay, cool. I'll do my retreat center over here on the land and I'll help you guys. I go back home. And I started getting invited to uh, ceremonies almost every week. And I was like running from it, hiding from it. I wanted nothing to do with it. And it finally took a woman that I was consulting for her 70s who had been doing plant medicine for 30 years and such a badass woman. And she's like, okay, one year we do a beginning for my company. Can you come since you're, you're doing this with us? And I said, okay, I'll come, but I'm not sure that I'm going to make it. And when I got there and I talked to the shaman, she really broke it down to where I could understand that this was not a drug because, you know, she explained with a drug, this is something that you take to escape yourself, to escape your problems, to, you know, and, and with a medicine, this is what you take to do the opposite. This is where you're going into the issues that are holding you back in your life. And this is where you heal those issues and, um, you know, where you're able to lift the veil and, and hear your soul and, and speak to your higher self. So I was like, okay, I'm in. Um, so that night I did my first plant medicine ceremony and 
I asked two questions. I said, okay, what is my life purpose? And why do I keep attracting the same guy over and over again? And at this time, I was like, I was in like the total full-blown dysfunction that <laughs> peaking with men. I was with this like super crazy, amazing Egyptian rapper that was just out of control. <laughs> like my people would look at my life and I could like play it off like I was all normal. I had my business going on and, you know, single mom had, you know, like a, a beautiful life that I created. And then you'd see my boyfriend, you'd be like, ah, that bitch is crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so, when I set the intention and the medicine dropped in, it took me back and I could finally, like for the first time, I could hear my inner voice, Crystal there speaking to me. And it took me back and showed me this whole story with mother. And it told me, you're an overcompensating mother because you didn't have a mother. You basically find all of these men that have these major issues with their mother. And because you're like the mama of mamas, you come in and they're like, mommy. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll save you. And we're like, we're playing this whole like codependent game with each other. And, you know, these are like beautiful, beautiful people. My teachers, I love all of them. But, you know, we would get into these patterns where, you know, I was like doing the work and then they were not wanting to do that work. And, you know, you meet someone at a certain place and if someone's doing all this spiritual work and someone's not, you like really quickly uh, are in different vibrations. <laughs> yes. And so every time it would end up <laughs> in the same disaster and I'd be like trying to save them, like, oh, you got to save yourself. And, um, and it would like take me down a big way where I, where it was really holding me back in life. And, and there was all kinds of stuff happening with like people uh, dealing with addictions. And it was like, I was playing out the story with my mother over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I was exhausted. And, um, then it showed me my, my calling and it was like that energy, like when you, you know, when you stop this, this whole pattern with men and you are able to put that energy into yourself and into this vision that is coming through, you know, this is your calling. And it showed me the Sleeping Giants project and it showed me, you know, how this, how we would be able to, you know, really awaken these people and especially showing, you know, to, to get people that are really able to make big changes in the world, you know, influencers, celebrities, uh, you know, people, entrepreneurs, people that have a lot of wealth and help them to um, realign themselves and step into service. Um, so at the time, really understand that this was all about plant medicine. Um, but shortly after that ceremony, um, I was introduced to Gerard Powell, uh, who later became my husband. And you know, he had the same vision to open a center in Costa Rica. He just had had his breakthrough awakening on Iboga and the moon came to him and told him that he was supposed to create a center and help people to heal their lives. And he heard that I had a center in Costa Rica, so we met up and he was partnered with Michael Beckwith and um, Dr. Jeff McNary from, from his rehab. And uh, we just decided we had to do this together. So we flew out to Costa Rica we started working with the Iboga and the spirit of Iboga was really giving us the visions, told us exactly what resort to buy. We found, we, we went to Rhythmia and it said, yep, this is the largest one. This is the one that you need to, to do it at. And that's how it all happened. That's how it all started. That's amazing. And, and you're in Gerard's <laughs> Iboga experience. That wasn't like a, a one time, two time. Like if I remember there was a long period of usage with Iboga giving you messages, right? And that's, I want to, I don't want to say pause for yeah. a second, but one of the beauties of plant-based medicine from the way that I view it, right? Whether it's Iboga, whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's mushrooms, the, the typical thought that might go through your head right now is it's addictive, right? It makes you want to do more. There's no addiction forming capacity of how these drugs interact inside your body, right? Certainly with me with mushrooms, like I enjoy the experience because it, it opens up new pathways. It has me thinking about new things from a, a, a more holistic or earthy way, right? You'll, you'll right. experience that if you go through it yourself. 
but it's not a thing of like I'm sitting right. here scratching my neck like I need some mushrooms right now. Like I'm fiending for for a hit no. of mushrooms. It's not that way at all. <laughs> no, no. When you go to the medicine, you're going to you know, to resolve something or to heal something or to go deeper into yourself. Uh, uh, you know, when I did mushrooms when I was a kid uh, to party and stuff, it actually would usually turn out to be something that wasn't, wasn't very good, you know, because like, uh, you know, like when you're a teenager and you're in that dark place, that's what's going to get reflected back to you. So it'd always be like these, these trips. So uh, I didn't really understand what, how these medicines were really used when used properly in a ceremony in the right context. But yeah, the last thing that I want to do is iboga or, or ayahuasca. That's something that I'm like, <laughs> it's not something that uh, I want to do for fun. Definitely not. <laughs> no, because if I remember, you said that you and Jerry used iboga for the better part of a year, right? Like on a consistent, yeah. was it daily basis? Not on the daily, but uh, we worked with it very regularly and uh, we worked with the 10th generation Bwiti shaman, Mugenda, this <laughs> total character and um, from Gabon. And yeah, it, it's, such a, it's such a different experience in the ayahuasca because it's, it's very um, masculine and it's very linear and direct. Like we would go in with a list of questions and we would have recorders. And then Mugenda would like guide us. So once we, you know, tapped in to the video game, that's how I would describe it. It's like you're in a video game and he's, he tells you to go to the moon and he like will tap your third eye until you, you get to the stars and then he'll say, okay, shoot to the moon. Um, or, you know, sometimes you would end up at different, different locations, but you're like there and people are showing up and you know like you'll have family members show up or whatever the issue is it's almost like you're watching your time on a movie that's incredible that's truly incredible and so yeah. <laughs> brandy that sounds like that was 2013 2012 2013 is that during that time period yeah i think around 2013. so what, what's interesting i'm leading you without you knowing where we're going so my apologies for that but the plant. So I truly, okay. be, I truly believe that the plants begin speaking to us when it's our time to start trying to find them, right? And ayahuasca has been in my presence, like the center of awareness for me for every bit of three years now. And I've had experiences that were planned that didn't go the right way, and some places I was supposed to travel to, and the wrong people showed up. It was just nothing has aligned the right way. But during that journey, you brought up Netflix. You guys had a whole documentary that was shot about what it is you've created, what it work, what it is, how it works. What's the documentary called? When did it come out? Like it completely changed my mind on what ayahuasca was, right? Cause I had that preconceived notion of like, and I want to do it, but I'm super nervous and I'm afraid it's going to be a bad experience. And it just, it's a beautiful experience. It's not a bad experience. Yeah. Well, actually I'll tell a little backstory about the film. It's called the reality of truth. And uh, it's, it's a film that has, you know, Deepak Chopra, um, Michelle Rodriguez, and, um, and the person who co-produced it, Zappi Zappelin, and, and they go on this journey through to have the, the ayahuasca experience. And then we have all of these different thought leaders, you know, Marianne Williamson, Ram Moss, and, and um, they're talking about their experiences or their opinions about the plant medicine. But um, just to back up uh, on the story of how that how we got involved in this film, and um, I ended up helping co-producing. But we wanted to make a film, and uh, back then, you know, five years ago, ayahuasca was so much more underground. And I'm like, we really need to like explain this, and and we need to have like the top, you know, people, the credible people, people from the science uh, field, to be able to explain this in a way that people can understand what this, what this plant does and make a film about it. Around that time, Gerard gets an email with a crowdfunding campaign. And there's a video with Deepak Chopra sitting in his living room. And he's like, oh, that's my living room. This is crazy. I let someone like five years ago use my living room to shoot a documentary film. So he clicks on it. And back then, you know, he was like drunk and high and uh, had no idea who Deepak Chopra was. <laughs> It's like his hairdresser asked him if he could use uh, his house to do this interview. And then, and then fast forward five years later, we click on this video and it's a whole video about plant medicine, ayahuasca with all of the 
you know, top thought leaders and people that we wanted to create our film with. So um, they were looking to raise money. They were only like halfway done with the film. So we reached out and we're like, yeah, let's, let's do this together. And so we picked up uh, halfway into the film. And the funny part is our story then becomes part of the story in the film. Uh, actually, when they first started making the film, Michelle Rodriguez and Zappi were having a conversation after having their experience in Peru. And they were like, we had to like, open a center in Costa Rica, a place where people could come and have this experience. And they were basically describing Rhythmia. And then, you know, the film, they were kind of looking for, well, what's the, what's the end of our film? And, and then it's just funny how it all came together. And then Rhythmia came in and partnered together. And, and that's how it happened. Well, certainly, I think we probably adopt or be- have the same belief system. Nothing happens by chance, right? That, that whole sequence of events, no. like, that had to happen the exact way it happened to get the message out the way that it's received by the marketplace, which is so beautiful, right? Like it's the ultimate divine is, is a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, no. And the film's been amazing. Like a, a lot of the people who come to Rhythmia have watched the film and it helps people to understand the experience and, and Rhythmia and the story. I love it. So, Brady, I'd like to get into a little bit more about what makes you you. Right? We touched base a little bit about bad relationships. We touched base a little bit about a bomb with uh, a couple dependencies. Right? I think it's so impactful to uncouple the beautiful soul that you are right, and the things that you've been through that have allowed you this incredible gift that you share with the world. Right? This is not, again, this is not by chance. The things you went through create the magic that's you right now. Yes, yes. Well, where do, where do you want to start? <laughs> uh, t- take, take us all the way back to some of the first memories of really, to me, the I believe, and I, I won't put words in your mouth, but so much of the, the teaching and the work that I do with my students is based around those early developmental childhood traumas that create the neural pathways and the belief systems that re- either propel us or limit us going forward. So I think it's always great to start back in some of those early memories where they sound like they were pretty crazy with you, right? It wasn't, uh, you know, tea parties yes. and, 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 and good times. <laughs> yes. Yes. It all goes back starting to Oak town, Oakland, California. That's where I'm from. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my name as a little girl was bean. And, uh, when I was five years old, well, I'll, I'll explain my parents a little bit. So my dad was like super rock and roll, so was my mom. Uh, he was working with like Bill Graham presents and, and working with like all of the huge rock stars during that time. And my mom was like a runaway from Oregon, this like, beautiful uh, woman who, who was, you know, basically just was born into a really screwed up life. You know, I found out actually this year that she was born from rape, which is really crazy. Um, her name is Randy and she named me Brandy. <laughs> And with two E's, I'm like, I think I was destined to be a stripper. My name's Brandy Lynn. Her name's Randy Lynn. But I took a wrong turn and ended up in, in life transformation work. But, uh, but uh, anyway, they, my father at, at five years old um, was, we were in our house and he committed suicide. And I walked into the room and uh, I saw him. And that was like the first time where I really split from my soul. Uh, after that, my mother turned, you know, she took my sister uh, and I and moved to Oregon and tried to like restart her life as a single mom. And she ended up on meth. And I basically lived in a meth house until I was 11 years old. So what I was exposed to during that time on a daily basis, uh, drug dealers, people on meth in our house, like daily. Um, my little brother was was born when I was eight years old and put his crib in my room. So it's super crazy because now I have my son who's 12 years old. And I remember when he was eight, I was like, holy shit, I was raising a child this at this age, you know, and I, it just like, you know, when, when it's you and you're in the experience as a child, you adapt to it and it all seems somehow normal. Uh, but you know, it it really put things into perspective. So I basically took on the role as the mother and I would take care of my mother, take care of my sister, take care of my little brother. I was changing his diapers, giving him his bottles, you know, like we would go to school a lot of the time. 
Uh, my mom was super, super wild. Like now I, I just have this such a love and respect for her because I really understand her, especially getting to meet her through the plant medicine. But she was this super mystical, wild woman who was just too sensitive for all that she had been through, you know? So, so for her, meth was her way of, of coping with it all. And, um, you know, but I, I also have these amazing memories of her, like just, you know, like we, we moved from house to house to house to house. I went to like nine different schools. We were constantly evicted. We had times where our electricity was out, where we didn't have food, where we were on food stamps. And, um, then she went to prison when I was like, 10 years old and we went to live with her mom for a year in this like really like rich area called Lake Oswego in Oregon. And I remember I got to the school and I felt like such an outcast. I was just like, Oh my God, I was from California. I liked Madonna, new kids on the block. The little, the kids in the, at that time were listening to bet or the rose was like the hit song. And, uh, and I remember like the kids were dressed like wearing matching sweaters with their moms. And I was just like, Oh, I, I, I don't fit in. So I just real I was like, all right, I'm just going to do me all the way full on, <laughs> you know? So I would just be like ripping my clothes from the Goodwill and making my own little style and then I got like these little girls on board and we created this like Madonna dance club and we uh when when like a prayer came out and she was wearing all of her like lingerie I got these girls to all show up to school dressed like that and wore our mom's like lingerie on top of our clothes and the funny thing is uh teachers were like, whose idea was this? And they're like, Brandy. And uh, they're like, okay, you're, you're expelled. You're, you're suspended. They call my mom and my mom comes in and she looks like Madonna on meth. <laughs> like she's like wearing fishnet tights, mini skirt ripped up, hair teased, makeup, all like goth. And she was so proud of me. She was like, Bean, I am so proud of you right now. We're going to Chuck E. Cheese. And the, and the, and the teachers were like so mad. So there's like all these like super cool things about my mom, even in all of the darkness, I really appreciate. Um, but, you know, basically for me, um, at 11 years old, you know, she was going in and out of prison. And finally, I got sent to live with my grandparents in Oakland, who are the complete opposite. They're born like, the, you know, my grandpa's like Italian, and they've never like, they don't cuss, they've never lied in their lives. They were like, leave it to beavers. So went from one extreme to the complete other and I had all of this anger and rage and pain and nobody would talk about what happened and it was all just kind of brushed under the rug and then going to school in Oakland you know like being the only white girl in school that was a whole nother crazy experience of just like I was in these schools with gangs and violence and drugs and uh, it's a miracle that I survived <laughs> really. But, uh, but this is what, what I had to deal with when, when, you know, when I, I, I got out of school, I had some, some things happen in high school where it was like for death. Like I had an incident happen where I was hanging out with these really, you know, hood rat kids from, from Oakland, from, from the projects, um, and thought that I was all bad and, and hanging out with them. And I ended up getting kidnapped, tortured, beaten. And, you know, that was the end of it for me. Like I made it out of that alive. And thank God I wasn't raped or anything. But, but you know, when I came out of that, I just was like, I'm done. I'm turning my life around. And, and I did. Um, and that's, I would say, like in my, my 20s, I had an experience, uh, you know, with a mystical experience. And actually my, my grandparents who raised me were in a head on accident in their eighties and they were helicoptered into a hospital. And t I was told that, that they were going to die, you know, at any moment. And my grandma's whole body was broken. She was in a coma on a, on a breathing machine. Her, her lung was punctured. Um, my grandpa had a stroke. His whole body was broken. And I just could not bear to live without my grandparents. They were my only, my only family. And I just prayed and started speaking to them. I, re I remember around that time I had found the, um, the, the movie, The Secret. And so I started like just s sending affirmations into their, their consciousness. And slowly they started coming back. And I, I actually lived in this hospital for a year with them. And I would like cook them their food and 
play, you know, their music and do everything to just bring them back. And, and it was actually miraculous how they healed. The doctors like had people coming to study some of the different things that had happened with them because it was, they said it was absolutely impossible. Um, but around that time, that was the first time that I was like out in El Dorado Hills, Sacramento area by myself, no distractions, you know, none of my crazy friends and all the stuff that I usually had going on in the chaos and the drama. And at that time, I had this experience with the sun, actually. The sun was shining on me, and I kind of went into this trance, and I felt myself just let go of something. And I went into, probably for a month, another dimension where I became super psychic and I started meditating and I had to read spiritual books and I didn't have one friend or anything that was into this stuff, but it was just, it was so, um, it was just in me. And that is what really kicked off my whole path with like self-development and spirituality and all of this. So. I mean, that, there's, there's so much there. That's such an incredible it's crazy. It's an incredible gift, right? Like I, I look at, you can view that two ways, but everything you've been, th- have been through created this, right? Like it's so right. crazy to see and hear what you've been through and then to see how you shifted the perspective on that, right? From that, I'm sure at some point the victim mentality and the pain and the hurt from what has happened to us, it's not in control into this whole other side where it's like, it's all a blessing, right? It's all a gift. Oh, it's such a gift. I would not change one thing, you know, and just to like, look, the process that we go through at Rhythmia is reconnecting with that child, you know, so Bean for me, once I reconnected with Bean through the plants and started building the relationship with her, this is what started, this is, this was me coming back home um, to my soul. And we're all those little kids, like we're all grown up little kids. And, you know, when you start looking at yourself that way, and when you start looking at other people that way, you can have compassion and forgiveness and the space to actually, you know, be able to do this work and to, to just take all the shame, blame, guilt, and judgment that keeps you stuck in this story. Like we get totally confused with our ego and these patterns, and we think that this is who we are. And this is our identity. And then, and then the shame, blame, guilt, and judgment, and all of it just keeps us trapped. What's so beautiful is with plant medicine, when you're able to, to separate that and see the story in the program and watch it like a movie and not, not take it on as, as who you are and be able to have the space to look at you know, the difference between your soul, authentic self, and this program, then you're able to actually get somewhere and start doing the work. Yeah, that, that's so beautiful the way you depict that. I, I appreciate just want to acknowledge, appreciate you just sharing all of that, the story, what you are, what you've been through. It's truly incredible to me. Yeah, but thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Brandy, I'm also super curious, right, that I have some things in my in my conscious right now about Jerry, right? Because he had your husband, mm-hmm. co-founder of Rhythma, he had some some successes, if I, if I remember, some successes in business and then was on the downward spiral of maybe alcohol and drugs and some other stuff. And there was a, an awakening, like I'm paraphrasing, right? Cause I don't know how much of that is true and how much of that I'm making up based off the movie yeah. and what I'm remembering from three years ago. Is it okay to discuss his story a little bit? I know I like to typically have, yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, first I have to back up first. I have to back up because we actually just recently announced that we, uh, we divorced, we changed the nature of our relationship and, okay. uh, and it's actually really beautiful what's happened because our relationship has transformed. We're continuing as business partners and friends. And we did this in a way that was just really awesome. Like we did it as friends. And, you know, he's been my best friend, a total a catalyst in my life. And we're continuing to be that for each other, but now shifting into this new relationship and it's you know and, and it, it's I, I'm excited to see where it all goes because it, it, it is hard being in a relationship and running a business together and living in two different countries um, you know we've been living apart for a couple of years now and commuting back and forth so so this is our new our new relationship together and um, and yeah just to go back to your question so um, so Gerard ha- has this crazy uh, story and he's he's so miraculous like 
I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of the way that he walked out of such a mess, <laughs> you know, and we both were, were hot messes, but I could say that, that he was, uh, he had, a, he had a lot more money to do a lot more damage with himself. <laughs> you know, he could take anything, any desire that he had, he could just go all the way and do it to, to the fullest power. So um, Gerard, I guess, uh, what year was that? You know, back probably like 10, 10 years ago, he sold his company for $50 million. He reached the American dream. Um, he had jets and houses all over the world and women all over the world. Everything, um, you know, every, every desire that he had, he went all in. And uh, he was idol. He had tried to, to kill himself, I think, two or three different times. And the crazy thing is he was doing this every time he had a goal to like, you know, make more money or, or get the next, buy the next thing. This is the time where he actually, you know, would be at his low because he would find that um, it didn't change anything. It didn't make him happier. It actually made him more depressed. And um, he came from a really difficult childhood. Like he was, you know, when he did Iboga, he went to the moon and the moon showed him, um, he, it showed him as a little boy being molested and by his grandfather and the moon came to him and took out his heart and it was like a black shrivel, shriveled up coal and this story is is told in the movie the reality of truth and he was it was explained that this is why you've been trying to kill yourself your entire life from this repressed memory and he had a complete healing of his heart the moon put it back into his heart and you know gave him instructions on how to live his life and told him that his addiction would be healed and that he was to go create a center to help other people have this healing. And um, so when I, I met Gerard, I remember like my, one of my best friends, Amir and I walked into his house and, you know, I mean, he was this big personality, this huge energy, super sweetheart. I looked around his house and he had these like giant pictures of naked women everywhere. And I was like, what the fuck? And I was, I said to my friend, like any woman that dates this guy is crazy. And then it was funny when we got married, uh, he reminded me of that. I'm like, I do <laughs> a couple years later, but, um, but yeah, so the, the funny thing, the, the great thing about Gerard is that like, he was on this path of like, of seeing himself and healing and he was going at it full force. So I always had so much respect for that, even though there was still like so much going on with him when, when we met Well, both of us, you know, we were both had our, our issues. And uh, as we started doing the plant medicine together and became business partners, the more that we healed and the more that we got in alignment with our true selves, with our authentic selves, it just came very clear at one point. We actually did a plant medicine ceremony together where the medicine told us, you guys are going to be together. And, uh, you know, I knew that there was an attraction and everything, but it was like a shock in this ceremony to be told really specifically about Rhythmia, about our souls, how we came in to create this, this together. And, um, but it said, but you guys can't be together yet. And it said, you will have a plant medicine ceremony where you're, you'll be told when you can be together. So, of course, that made things super hot. We're like, we're, you're not allowed to each other. It, the medicine, literally, you guys could hold hands. So, for uh, six months, that's what we did. And then, finally, it got to a point where we were able to be together. And we had this super beautiful relationship together. And I love everything that we did together, um, our relationship and building the business. It's been it's been amazing and magical. I love it. And I guess congratulations on the next season of your life, right? There's, there's expansion on the other side of change. Thank you. So wonderful. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so Brandy, for some of my more intellectual listeners, some of the ones that are curious about the science behind how ayahuasca works, right? Like I'll paraphrase the pieces and parts that I know about how our bodies naturally produce DMT and it's in the spinach that we eat and it's in the plants, but something goes on inside of us when we metabolize it and it doesn't make it psychoactive for us, right? It doesn't un unlock that part of us. But something about ayahuasca itself with the DMT that's present in ayahuasca when it's combined with something and turned into this special, I'll call it potion to me, all of a sudden the active ingredients, psychoactive ingredients are now able to be metabolized by your body. Am I 
anywhere close to how it actually works. Actually, I, I think you better explain this. You, sound, you can explain this better than me scientifically. I can explain things like when it, like I, I'm more experiential and my experience is really more um, um, hands-on and, and just, you know, I, I guess I would be more of a person that would explain it from, uh, you know, what actually happens and how to take the, you know, different... Um, modalities or you know different ways to go into the experience to have you know to get the most out of it like our teens and and really it's all been built around our own experiences so we've taken what we've learned what worked on ourselves and then we created it into a program to help other people navigate their own experiences because we're all uh we're all healers we're all shaman we all have this we're all these these technologies with infinite capabilities that that are mind-blowing and um i love empowering people to you know not to go into ceremony knowing that that it's not just uh up to the shaman to <laughs> you're not just at the mercy of the shaman that you actually can navigate this experience on your own and so um, that's really the perspective that i come from a lot with it well i love that so i'll lean into that for a second out of my curiosity so yeah an ayahuasca ceremony right? There's typically how many people in a ceremony? Is there music? Are you walk around? Is it eyes open, eyes closed? Are you laying down? Are you standing? Like, can you paint the picture of what that could look like and literally allow the audience to imagine themselves at the beautiful resort that's with me going through one of these ceremonies? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're, you, we lay down on beds and, uh, we take the medicine, we, we, we started out, you know, with intentions and um, with meditation and, and then we take the medicine and it kicks in and it usually, usually one cup of medicine will last for um, a few hours and everybody has a different experience. There's different ways of, of healing. It all is very unique to the person who's there and it's so incredible how divinely orchestrated everything is you know when you start working with the medicine you get to see how incredibly uh perfect every little detail is from who you're sitting next to to who is in the room with you you know when i would work with the medicine sometimes i would be blown away when i would see that all of these different people were having the same visions you know for instance there was one ceremony where different people coming up to me telling me that they were having this experience as a Native American uh, in a tribe that was being slaughtered. And they were not talking to each other. But this is what's so beautiful is you be having these, you know, your own experience and healing, but the soul is also having this, this healing and you don't know who's in the room with you. But chances are that you've been with these people before if you're there, you know, in ceremony again. And so there's all these different layers of things that are being healed and cleared. And sometimes we see it and sometimes we're not even aware of what is being healed and cleared. I, I, I'm like out of my skin excited to get down to Rhythmia and get to experience seven days of this. <laughs> like it's been such a, a blessing, right? This is something I've wanted for so long and I'm, I feel so fortunate to have gotten introduced to you and started to become friends with you and share time and space on, on the show with you. Like, it's truly incredible. Just Oh, my gosh. The divine intervention. I, right? I like, cannot wait. I have to be there. I have to be there when there with your wife, you know. It, I'm super excited. Yes. Yeah, so, Brandy, if someone wanted more information on Rhythmia, right, somebody wants to either inquire about coming down or follow you on social media or get a hold of the right pieces and parts, where, what's the social media handles? Who do they contact? What's the best way into the experience that's Rhythmia? Yeah. You can go to rhythmia.com. Uh, you can check out The Reality of Truth. is a great movie to watch. It's free on YouTube um, for more information. And um, it's also really helpful to watch. Like our, our every week we do Facebook Lives where, you know, different guests are sharing their experiences if you want to learn more about what's happening in the experience. And, um, yeah, if you go to rhythmia.com, you can get the 800 number to call in. And we have a staff that can answer questions and, and help, you know, get, guide you and give you the right information. And we make sure, you know, we go through a whole process of screening every person who comes in to make sure, uh, you know, what their background is and what their medical history is. So, yeah. 
I love it. So as, as you're listening, in the bottom of the iTunes show notes, I'm going to put links to Rhythmia. There's a good chance by now if you're consuming this content, you're on my mailing list, you'll see three or four emails right after you hear this episode about some pieces and parts of Rhythmia. And then while I'm down in Costa Rica, you'll see consistent feeds and updates on what's going on. I implore you, if this is something that's calling to you, like if this speaks to you, Take that action and at least get the information. Bring it into your awareness, bring it into your consciousness, and allow it to manifest itself the way it's supposed to. There's a good chance right now might not be the right time to dive all the way in, but to start the process, like you have to start it somewhere. And this is a literally, and not because Brady's yeah. on the show, from all the research I've done, this is like the the five star resort, the pinnacle of how to have this plant based experience. You're not traipsing around the jungle in Peru, which is a is an opportunity as well, but this is as holistically appropriate and contained as I think could ever be while in the most luxurious accommodations with some of the best people in the world, like you've created something that's magic, right? Like you literally have created magic out of thin air. Yeah. It's pretty amazing what's happening there. Like the, just to watch the miracles and the, the things that are happening to people, the healings every single week. It's such, it's like the biggest blessing to be able to serve that way. Um, and I also have, um, and March 3rd coming up, I have a women's week where all women come. It's called Majesty. And uh, it's the whole story of the feminine from the beginning of creation where we're upgrading our DNA, releasing all of the disempowering stories um, that women are dealing with. And uh, so I just want to put that out there in case any women are interested in coming. Uh, it's going to be a really awesome week. Well, and is that down at the resort as well, Brandy? Yeah, yeah. It's at the resort and it's so epic for women to just do medicine with 80 women together. And we have um, this, there's an artist named Paya, who's one of my favorite medicine artists who's going to be playing live in the ceremonies. And um, we, the, actually the program is, is uh, we have different facilitators that come in and it's basically like a modern day mystery school for women. So we're taking like the ancient teachings from the mystery schools of Egypt for women and bringing it uh, to Rhythmia for the week. Talk about a powerful, powerful group of 80 people coming together. That, that divine feminine energy, that's incredible. What, what, I got, now we're just shifting. I mean, screw it. The interview's not over now. When, when, <laughs> when, when did you start that? What, was, what brought that on? Is there a masculine side? You know, did, did Gerard put on a masculine side too that eventually evolved somewhere? What, this is just another layer that I'm curious about. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because at the very beginning, like Gerard, Gerard is such a channel on the medicine. Uh, I mean, we both are, but I'd be blown away when certain things would come through him because he had never read a lot of the things that he was speaking. You know, he'd be like dropping ancient uh, information from Egypt or from these, from the mystery schools. And I, it was things that I knew about you know, he's talking with his Pennsylvania accent, like, okay, so this is the onk and we're going to do a soul murder. And I just feel like, what are you saying right now? But uh, one of the things that he said that was amazing was that the spiritual intention of Rhythmia, and he said this about five years ago um, on the medicine, was to balance the masculine and feminine energy in ourselves, that really we have created this as kind of a, a playground for us to awaken ourselves. And then, you know, to, to share that balance, uh, by creating that balance in ourselves, we would be able to help facilitate the balance of the masculine and feminine and the people that came to the center, and then they would take that out into the world, and that this is what the world is actually going through right now is this balance of masculine and feminine energy. And from that, it turned into, like, my ceremonies and my life and my dreams. It was all so much of it had to do with balancing these energies in myself, like understanding what is the feminine, what is the masculine, what is the lower feminine, and what is the lower masculine, and, um, you know, how to get these energies in balance. And, you know, in the mystery schools in Egypt, actually, this was their path to ascension. So um, the, the women had a particular role, like, it, it's not to say that uh, all women are, and men are exactly the same, but women typically would be you know, the visionaries, they would be the ones, uh, you know, at the head of the temples of the governments and basically uh, would channel and download the information about 
you know, technologies or visions on, you know, running the society. And the men were the ones that would take these visions out and execute them. And uh, they were the ones that could take the idea and bring it into order. And so uh, their, their, their spiritual beliefs were around balancing these, the, the masculine and feminine. So basically relationships with men and women spiritual intention is to basically take the the energy from each and be able to to balance it as one and to begin become one again with creator and so the men you would see they would wear like um these wigs as a symbol that they had mastered their energy um and so it's so yeah this is the same similar theme that we're we're bringing into modern times I love it. I love it. So how often is the women only event? Is it once a year? Is it once a quarter? Is it, is it whenever this, whenever the plant tells you to, right? What's the frequency if a woman wants to come solo, right? I have a pretty good audience of men and women, right? It's about 50, 50. So there's a chance that this is speaking yeah. to just a woman that just loves what you have to say. Yeah. Um, I basically, I just tune into when I'm called to create another one. Um, I, it's looking like I'm going to be doing one every quarter and then I'm creating, um, versions like weekend versions in Los Angeles and different places around the world, different level initiations. So, you know, this is the first initiation and then we go into all different levels, just like they did in the mystery schools, uh, around the world. So there's, you know, we, we're working with plant medicine, we're working with, you know, activating our feminine power, um, you know, how to activate the shaman, the healer, the creatrix, the intuitive in us, and, uh, you know, the, the missing woman. So we all have these, and we all have these abilities. And so we're, we're helping everybody to tap into that in themselves. I absolutely love it. I mean, like, it's just so amazing. <laughs> like this is just the best conversation to me. So sa same thing, Brandy, with that, if a woman's listening, still email into Rhythmia. Is that the best way for them to start down that path as well? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Go to Rhythmia. Um, check out. There's a, a website up where it breaks down all of the different um, practitioners and, and what program will be that week. Um, you could go to social media. We have um, a majesty video that kind of breaks down what the program is about. Excellent. So, Brandy, to kind of put a bow on this episode, if you were to leave from all your mystic capability, from everything you've been through, if there was one gift that you could leave with the listener that they could take away and apply to their life just from all the things you've been through, what would that be? Ooh, medicine. <laughs> everybody should do that. I think everybody should do the medicine. And from, you know, but I, I would say one of the most important things to understand is that a lot of times you hear of these miraculous stories and people start thinking that, you know, the medicine is like this magic pill that you can take and woo, your life is all perfect. And I think one of the most important things to understand is that 50% of the healing happens on the medicine. So the medicine comes in and it creates a space, creates awareness, um, you know, for the healing. And some people have worked their lives up to this point where they're ready to just have this instantaneous healing. Like I've seen a blind person be able to see again or a person with, uh, you know, an incurable disease cured instantly. But a lot of times, um, more times, people are going through a process and so life is actually the initiation. And so you take the medicine, you have the awareness. You receive the healing, the space is open, but now you've got to step into life to work the other 50% and the rest of it is on you. And it's how you show up to work that new muscle and to build it and to um, integrate it into your life so that you embody it. You know, so a lot of people come to the medicine and they drink it and they think, you know, okay, I drink it. I got the, I got the big vision. And when you don't take it into life and actually work it, um, you can lose it. So it's, what's really amazing about the medicine is, is the spirit stays in you. So it's like having a therapist, a coach working with you in real life, and then life becomes this initiation for you where it sets up all the perfect situations um, for you to build that muscle. And so a lot of times, like, you'll, you'll have this big aha, you'll be glowing and, you know, feel amazing and that you got it. But then life will come and smack you back down. And it's remembering that that is actually happening for you, not to you. And so it's all about how you approach 
the challenges and the problems and the difficulties in life, like really seeing that it's here to support you and it's giving you an opportunity to use that new model and make a, um, you know, a conscious decision rather than operating from your patterns. So, so for me, that is one of the greatest gifts is just to, to understand that we are not our patterns, um, to basically approach the medicine like a child and to basically say, you know, show me who I have become as a result of this life. And the more open that you are to seeing it all, to seeing what the stuff that you don't want to see, to seeing what the things that your friends and your family see, but they don't want to tell you, the more available you are to hearing that is the first step. And then once you're able to see who you've become and what your patterns are, then you can ask to be merged back with your soul on medicine and then you can ask for your heart to be healed. And that is how you walk out of the experience a changed person. I mean, I love it. I love it because I know there is no way you would have known prior to this moment that I have said in every episode since Mushrooms that if I could give one gift to the world, it would be that everybody simultaneously experiences mushrooms or some sort of plant medicine. Right, like it just changes your perspective. Yes. Like I love the fact that you shared that. That there's, if you're listening, there's no notes. Right, I didn't hold up a sign for her to see. Like that was just a f from the heart. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brandy, for your time. I love you. Thank you for being on the show. Sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to to do it with you. I can't wait to see it with Mia. Yes, thanks, Brandy. <laughs> <laughs>